Thank you very much, um, Dean Russ. I'm wondering if you can all hear me without too much of an echo, because I can take this thing off and really shout <laughs> if that would help. Are you ladies okay? Because I was getting, how about over here? All right, good. Well, it's indeed a pleasure to be at Gordon College. Uh, my first time. Your school is very well known throughout the country. I'm sure you are aware. Uh, it, along, I guess, with Calvin and Wheaton, um, is regarded as one of the very best top evangelical colleges, liberal arts schools in the nation. So it's my pleasure to be here to talk with you, first about Tolkien and then later about Flannery O'Connor. These are my heroes, so I'm simply exposing for your like or dislike people who shaped my life. I wouldn't be here today, quite candidly, were it not for Flannery O'Connor and J.R.R. Tolkien. I was expressing to a friend um, during lunch a slight alarm I have, however, and I'm hoping it's not fulfilled at Gordon College. And that is, up until about five years ago, I could be assured that almost all of my audience, when I came to places to speak on Tolkien, would have read all 1,200 pages of The Lord of the Rings, plus the appendices. <laughs> As we say in Texas, from Genesis to the maps. Um, I have become worried, however, in recent years that the movies have come to replace the reading of the Lord of the Rings. Yours is an eminently visual culture. You receive the world through a screen. Uh, someone has said current students are like toadstools. They grow at night <laughs> under a dim light of the flickering screen. So at the risk of very great offense, I'm gonna ask, how many of you have read all three volumes of The Lord of the Rings? Wonderful, wonderful. So Gordon is a superior place. <laughs> I shall go back with the good news that you folks here are still readers because reading is a moral act, a deeply moral and religious act because it is an act of concentration. It's an act of imagination. It takes you out of yourself takes me out of myself into a larger world, which I not only have to imagine myself into as a sympathizer with that world, but where I have to form the images that the words on the page enable me to form. By contrast, most films form images for us. And for that reason, I think film is a lazier medium than the written word. So that you're exalting the written word here at Gordon pleases me greatly. Thank you very much. I thought I would talk about Tolkien as a writer, um, so to speak, of 9-11. A writer who addresses the world that's blowing up in the Middle East, even as we speak a writer who helps us to think about what it would happen if the terrorists were to strike Boston as they struck New York. To help us confront how we are to live in the face of ongoing terror that has become, whether we acknowledge it or not, the background noise of our lives. It's there, it's there. It's there. You may know, if you don't know, you should know, that the 20th century was the deadliest century in the history of the human race. So if you get one statistic today, get this one. More people were killed by violent means in the 20th century than in all preceding centuries combined. Roughly 190 million. And of course, we Americans did our share of that killing. 
And we Americans had done our share of that killing prior to Hiroshima, prior to Nagasaki. We have our own holocaust, as Wendell Berry puts it. It began right here in Massachusetts. If you don't know the book called Mayflower, I urge you, get thee to the bookstore in a hurry. It's a book about King Philip's War and about the slaughter of the Native Americans by our Christian forebears. We have had our Holocaust. Not to mention what we did to the slaves whom we brought over from Africa under coercion, the power of the ring, so to speak. In, on an average South Carolina plantation, a slave was worked to death in eight years. We have inherited a horrible, horrible history of massive death. I was on my way to Duke to give a lecture in 2001 before the events of September 11. Picked up a, a newspaper that gave the statistic that in just the first nine months of the 21st century, 1.6 million had died. So you see where we're going? We're on our way, it seems, toward a new century of fire and blood, an age incarnadine, to use Milton's phrase. How are we to live in the face of that? What are we to do? It seems to me that Tolkien's immense popularity as a writer is precisely because he doesn't dodge that question of how we are to live and what we are to do. And he does so as a Christian. Many people do not know that Tolkien was a Christian writer. There are some who dispute whether he was a Christian writer. Not only was Tolkien a Christian writer, Tolkien was a Catholic writer. And you must be honest about the Catholicism, the deep Catholicism that underlies the Lord of the Rings, though it's not visible very often. It's visible just in three places. In the figure of Galadriel, Tolkien says, I could not have imagined Galadriel without my devotion to our blessed lady, Mary. It pleased me greatly to hear that you had a conference on Mary here at Gordon College, I think, or someone can tell me not long ago. Secondly, something that some of my Protestant students at Baylor don't get is the presence of Limbos. Limbos. They say, well, maybe it's like manna in the Hebrew Bible. Well, it is like manna. It's light. It's airy. It's thin. It doesn't, however, really nourish the stomach, but strengthens the soul and the will. Therefore, you can all get it. It is not an allegory of, Tolkien dislikes allegory, it is a hint at the Eucharist, its sacramental bread. Remember, it's elven bread. It's called bread for the way. That's what literally the Lord's Supper is. It's way bread, bread to put us on the way. And finally, and most subtly, this is my only discovery, by the way, uh, that I can take credit for, is the scene where Aragorn comes upon Baromir. You all have that scene in your mind? Where Baromir, of course, is the one who had tried to seize the ring from Frodo. Now note well, the ring's, the, 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 the company's unity, the company's common purpose, the company's mission is broken, not by an orc, not by a warg, not by a Balrog, but by a member of the fellowship, Baromir. Not by a secular humanist, those awful people, <laughs> but, but by one of our own. But notice he is not a Judas. 
Baramir is not a Judas. If he could be said to have Christian echoes, that's what Tolkien is after, he is, of course, Peter, the one who betrays our Lord thrice on the night in which Christ was crucified, and yet who is brought back into the kingdom. And that's exactly what Aragorn is doing. He is striving to use good Catholic language, the sins of Boromir, as Boromir makes his final confession to Aragorn. And therefore, Aragorn dies in a state of grace. Now, people will say, but most, most readers don't get that. Why didn't Tolkien make it plainer? And the answer is, he didn't want to. That was not his aim. I recall receiving a question, and I may get one after this, this lecture of this sort, where a student said, can you name me one person that Tolkien has ever led to the Lord? I said, no, of course not. And it would not have bothered him a whit because that was not his aim. That was not his purpose. C.S. Lewis is an evangelist from first to last. More people were brought to the gospel by Lewis in the 20th century, probably than any other single writer, Billy Graham, of course, as a, as a preacher, many more, but as a writer, Lewis. Tolkien felt that the church has as its mission the witness of evangelism, the witness of preaching, the witness of the discipline, ethical life. And therefore, for him, art must stand on its own legs. He said, if my work has to be propped up on Christian stilts, then it fails as a work of art. He says, it must endure as a work of art in its own right. So here is my prophecy. It will I know this pleased some of you. That's okay. I've already got my check. Um, <laughs> I believe that in the long haul, a hundred years from now, if the terrorists don't blow us up, two hundred years from now, Tolkien will still be read. Tolkien has staying power. I've read The Lord of the Rings more times than I would like to count. And every time I uncover layer after layer after layer of meaning that I hadn't begun to fathom, Tolkien will last, I think, in a way that Lewis will last, certainly he's already lasted long, but not as long as. Now, why? I thought I would talk, therefore, about only three things this afternoon. We Baptists don't know how to do it, except in threes, and I will not read a poem at the end. It's a usual Baptist sermon. But I want to talk about instead the way in which Tolkien helps us resist what he regarded, and I think quite rightly, as the three chief evils of the modern world as they are, again, his, hinted at, linked to, suggested by the ring. Now remember, Tolkien is not an allegorist. Lewis is an allegorist. Aslan is Christ of Narnia. If you don't get that, then get an IQ test. You know, you're slow on the uptake. There is no Christ in the Lord of the Rings. None. Gandalf is not Christ. He dies, apparently, comes back to life, he doesn't die for the sins of the world. He saves the other eight members of the company. Frodo acts very much as a Christ, bearing the ring in the way our Lord bore his cross. My favorite character, Sam, is a sort of Christ. He bears Frodo up the side of Mount Doom, carrying his own master. So you follow me? There are no one-to-one -one allegorical parallels and links in Tolkien. The ring is not the atomic bomb. 
It has qualities not unlike that. The ring is not the terrorism of 9-11. It has qualities like that. Instead, the ring has three distinctive powers. And I want to talk about each of them and then let you ask me some questions. And of course, the question always to be asked is, why would Tolkien seize upon these particular qualities? The first quality is the power of invisibility. If you put on the ring, you instantly disappear, except in one case. Can anyone name the one case in which if you put on the ring, it doesn't make you disappear? Hands? There'll be a test at the end of the hour. Yes, ma'am, loudly. Tom Bombadil, right. Thank God Peter Jackson didn't try to betray him. What a mess he would have made of Tom Bombadil. Because Bombadil is sui generis. He's a thing unto himself. About, more about that later if you so wish. But about everybody else, to wear the ring is to vanish. Now Tolkien had a really good education, like the kind you're getting here at Gordon College. Therefore, he had read Plato's Republic, like you read Plato's Republic at Gordon College, right? Yes, yes, thank you. And had discovered one of the most important debates in the Republic. Socrates, as you know, I trust, believes that to know the good is, in a very real sense, to do the good. Knowledge is the chief requisite for virtue. So that one who truly understands what good is will do the good. And above all, without reward. That's, Plato, that's um, through, through Socrates, Plato's contention. Goodness is its own reward. It does not need any kind of payoff. Glaucon says, now hold it, Socrates. And Glaucon, oddly enough, is a better Christian than Socrates. Let me tell you about a man named Gyges, G-Y-G-E-S, Gyges, who had a magical ring. And with that ring, it made him disappear, and therefore he could get whatever he wanted. For example, he could steal without ever being caught because he would go in and get what he wanted and disappear. If he had enemies, he could strike them and never be apprehended. He could kill without ever being prosecuted. Who would know he did it? Not least of all, he could have all the women he wanted. And so, Gyges winds up, of course, killing the king and having the queen as his own woman. And so Glaucon's point is, goodness is not its own reward. If you gave people certain kinds of power, they will do evil. And so Tolkien makes this one of the great attractions of the ring. Bilbo, for example, is already drawn to the ring, drawn by its power of invisibility. So why would Tolkien do this? Why would he make invisibility a chief quality of the ring in order to get at some kind of contemporary modern problem. Gollum, of course, has used the ring and its powers of invisibility. And here, watch out, be very careful. This is where Tolkien's Christianity comes in the back door because it isn't the ring alone that has power. There is another power which the ring doesn't know about that's greater than the ring and therefore make sure that the ring has only limited power. So Gollum has found the ring. He's kept the ring for 500 years. But rather than being like Gyges in the Republic, he's used the ring to catch fish. 
and to eat them raw. That's one of the best scenes, by the way, in the, in the movies. Gollum, you know, really gnawing into a piece of raw fish. So you see, he has used the ring greedily, selfishly, but fairly harmlessly. But of course, once he loses the ring, by accident, maybe, um, then now it's going to have the same really corrupting power on anyone else who has it. When Tolkien was asked, what would you call the modern equivalent of invisibility, i.e. magic? Now remember, there is almost no magic in The Lord of the Rings. Gandalf is not a magician. Gandalf is a master of the craft called fire. Sauron's name is Sorcerer. And your Gordon education will have taught you that Sorcerer is another word for magician. So Tolkien was asked, what for you is the chief form of modern magic? And he answered, technology. Because modern technology lets us become virtually invisible. Think of the internet. You can say anything on the internet and be held accountable for nothing on the internet. Now, Tolkien's not a Luddite. Tolkien's not a hater or destroyer of machines. But he worries about the way in which machines crunch time. That's a very, that's a very phrase we like to use. We not only crunch numbers, we crunch time. Whereas for Tolkien, time is meant to be slow, gradual, drawn out. Because everything good takes time to make. Tolkien spent from 1939 until 1954, 15 years, writing The Lord of the Rings. Sitting, two -leg, uh, sitting cross legged in the middle of his bed with all of his notes around him, typing out two fingers, what I call the biblical method seek and ye shall find. <laughs> typing out two fingered draft after draft after draft of The Lord of the Rings. His son Christopher has now edited those drafts. Twelve fat volumes beyond the 1,200 pages plus appendices. But you see, Tolkien poured himself into that work. For Tolkien, anything that we make, should, there should be a great distance between the conception of an idea and its realization, its fulfillment, its completion. I talked with a young man at lunch about his desire to be a teacher. And one of our main points was becoming a teacher takes a long time. If you become a college teacher, it means you're going to go to graduate school at least eight years, probably longer. This is my 40th year in the classroom. I'm, I'm beginning to get the hang of it. <laughs> my wife and I have been married 47 years. We're not too far away from it, a real marriage. You got it? Most American marriages fail, 50%. And by the way, evangelicals, about 2% above the average because we won't take time. We don't spend the effort, the long haul that makes for anything good. Remember, Gandalf has spent 19 years studying ancient manuscripts to find out whether the ring that Frodo came upon is in fact the one ruling ring. He didn't just know that instantly. It took him 19 years. So for Tolkien, our crassly material world is in fact a desire for invisibility. We want to become anonymous. 
we in fact really want to disappear. It's not that we care about things. We run through things. We, that, that's our name. We're consumers. We eat things, as it were. We consume houses. I've been told that whereas interior decorations used to be about once every 20 years, they have gradually come down to once every 10, to once every 5, and there are many wealthy places in America where homes are redecorated every year. You with me? We are not part and parcel of those things we make. We use them. We consume them. We destroy them. Invisibility. The second power of the ring, and by the way, they ratchet up. to ever greater intensity, is deathlessness. If you possess the ring, you will go on living and living and living. It has the power to overcome mortality. Why would Tolkien make that a modern kind of analogy of the way in which we are tempted by our own evils. Remember, the elves have the gift of immortality naturally. Elves don't die naturally. Elves can be killed physically, or interestingly enough, elves can grieve themselves to death. You can die of grief, and you can be killed, but you don't die naturally. Notice how. The elves come to envy the hobbits and the dwarves for the gift of death. The gift of death. What does that mean? Bilbo explains it. You remember, Bilbo is exceedingly reluctant to give up the ring. It has already begun to work its power on him. He doesn't want to even though he knows it's his mission, it's his calling, it's his vocation, to let Gandalf give Frodo the ring. He doesn't want to let go. In fact, if you remember, Gandalf has to threaten Bilbo before Bilbo will surrender the ring. And of course, the reason is Bilbo has gone on living and living and living. Except that, you remember what he says? When he finally gives up the ring, he says, you know, I feel thin and stretched, like too little butter over too much bread. Wonderful, simple, homely analogy, like too little butter over too much bread. Which, of course, is Tolkien's way of saying that the modern world lets us live longer and longer and longer and longer horizontally, but not better and better and better vertically, qualitatively. Illustration. A friend of mine was visiting when I was teaching on the faculty at Wake Forest, we drove past the huge medical complex that now is the center of every city, along with its commercial complex or its golf course. Suburbs are centered around golf courses, cities are around medical and commercial complexes. Every medieval city was centered around a cathedral. Look at the shift that's occurred. My friend looked up at the huge medical complex that dominates downtown Winston-Salem and said, behold the house that death has built. We're all in flight from death. He later said to me what I will never forget. He said, if you ask the average American which, of course, means me, and means you, and you, and you, and you, and you. What is the purpose of life? 
If we are caught off guard and don't calculate quickly to give a correct Christian answer, so-called, we will say, the purpose of life is not to die, but to stay alive as long as possible in order to have a good time. You ever heard anything as insane as that? (laughs) Walker Percy says the last sound the average American will ever hear is the squish of nurses' shoes going down the hospital hall. (coughs) Horrific image. (coughs) We are a death-fearing, death-denying, death-escaping culture. And Tolkien nails it by giving the ring the power of deathlessness. For Tolkien, by contrast, The purpose of life is, as I've told you, a very serious Catholic Christian. The purpose of life is to die. Rightly, well, toward the right end, for the right good. As our Lord says, if you come after me, let her deny herself. Take up her cross. And follow me. For what shall it profit a woman to gain the whole world and lose her soul? For what shall a woman give in exchange for her soul? The cross is an instrument of death. Christians are bearing a cross toward our deaths. That's the way we make our witness in the world. I once heard Cardinal George of Chicago say, remember, we've got to go out there and tell people that dying is good for you. It really is. Because you see, death gives life its focus. Death gives life its, what the Greeks call its telos, its end, its aim, its purpose. Imagine what it would be not to die. Well, it would mean I would never have to do anything. I would always have tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace, this manifest. Yes. Or else, more of this, more of this, more of this, bang. Complacency on the one hand, despair on the other. Death gives life its point. That's why, for example, we celebrate the saints not on their birthday. We celebrate the saints on their death day. The Catholics call it their anniversaries. Because then is when we make our entry into the life of the world to come. Third and last, and worst by far. The ring has the power of coercion. It not only lets you be invisible if you wear it, it not only lets you go on living lengthily but not qualitatively, but it means you can suborn others to your will. You can make others do what you want them to do. And above all, if you have the ring, it will dominate you until you are completely in its power. Well, why would Tolkien seize upon that quality? The reason, I think, is pretty obvious. Ours is an age of massive coercion. Massive coercion. Coercion. Think of the death camps. Think of Auschwitz, Dachau, Flossenburg, where Dietrich Bonhoeffer was hanged. People's wills coerced. Think of the gulag in Stalinist Russia. Think of the compulsory labor camps, so-called re-education camps in 
communist China. You'll say, well, that's not us. We don't coerce people in America. We are the nation of the free and the home of the brave. Really? Are you sure about that? This is a harsh example, but I must use it. I came to my class one day in Baylor, at Baylor, and I was trying to teach the basic fundamental lesson that evil slips up on us, that evil, evil grabs hold of us, that evil takes us over and coerces our will so that we don't even know it. And there sat a young lady on the front row. This is not at Harvard, this is at Baylor wearing a very tight-fitting shirt pullover that read, Goats do like to nibble. Now what has happened to that young girl is that she did not wake up one morning and say, I am going to be a slut. No, never. You see, our culture sexualizes you folks so early so young, so coercively, you don't have any alternative. I have students now who ask me the question, why should we have children? We have no hope of bringing them up in the world without their corruption by a sodden culture like ours that will coerce them without any freedom to resist. The things that I would, I do not. And those things that I would not, they are the things I do. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? St. Paul is talking about the very same reality of coercive evil. If that is a harsh illustration, here's one even harsher. Find again to get why Tolkien is so popular and why he is so powerful. And I will give you a way of, of preparing for this without being too shocked by it. I've had students come up to me and say, after I've read Tolkien, I feel clean. I feel clean. You know what they're getting at? You should, if you've read Tolkien. It's not that he's squeaky clean. It's not that no one's evil. I mean, everyone, to one extent or another, except for Gandalf, though Gandalf says, don't you tempt me with the ring. I'd be the worst one to have it. Everyone is corrupted by the ring in one way or another. But here's the example I would use, that within 50 yards or a hundred of the Gordon campus, marijuana could be found tonight. There probably is a campus drug dealer. At Wake Forest, the students told me he was the last person you would ever suspect. He didn't look like the campus drug dealer. Let's say one wants to go a ratchet up from marijuana to the next level, which is crack cocaine, of course. That's good. That's good. That's really good. I've got to have more. You with me? Caught. Trapped. Coerced. You can't break out of that on your own. So Tolkien offers us ways out of those free traps. Very briefly, let me rehearse them and then let you fire questions at me. Regarding the matter of invisibility, 
and how it might be best resisted. Tolkien offers the solution, and I'm here seizing upon the classical, what are called uniquely theological virtues of the Christian tradition, which balances them, by the way, with the four so-called pre-Christian virtues. Be sure you learn these at Gordon in their proper order, prudence, justice, courage, and temperance. Then the three uniquely Christian virtues are faith, hope, and charity, in that order. Faith for Tolkien is trust. Faith is the willingness to put one's life in the hands and keeping of another. And of course, ultimately that means in the keeping of God's own hands. The way that occurs in the Lord of the Rings is through the company, through the fellowship, and the way they are totally bound to each other in complete trust, faithfulness, loyalty, devotion. If you remember when Elrond is, is choosing the nine who will constitute the nine walkers over against the nine riders of the ring race, it's a truly multicultural company. I get so amused, everybody demanding diversity, diversity. You've got it in spades. Now, Tolkien couldn't make the company to number 12. Got it? He's so obviously Christian, it would be insulting. But he still uses a Trinitarian number, the Trinity, Trinity, nine. So you've got Gandalf. Gandalf is of the same rank as Sauron. He's a Maya. Complex, but I won't explain. You've got, of course, two humans. Aragorn, the rightfully returning king, and Baramir, the brother of Faramir. Watch out, we humans are the ones that mess things up. Then you've got two historic enemies. An elf, Legolas, and of course a dwarf, Gimli who have been schooled to hate each other, to rival each other, but by the end they become absolutely inseparable from each other. Then you have, of course, Frodo and his sidekick, bumbling, stumbling, always messing up Sam, my favorite character because I'm a lot like him. And then who else? Who else? Elrond is trying to think of someone really powerful, really strong, that can go and accompany these seven so as to make them a force of real strength. Suddenly, Mary and Pippin said, you can't leave without us. And remember, Frodo is 51 when he embarks upon the quest. And even by Habitic age, 51 is more or less like 35. Sam would be in the neighborhood of 35. Mary and Pippin are, as I remember, 29, which would make them kind of early, mid-teens. So they're teenagers. They say four words when the company is being formed that could be said to be the motto of the whole of the Lord of the Rings. Anyone remember them? You can't leave without us. I think it's Mary who says it. How dare you, Frodo? We are your friends. Friends. No friendship among the orcs. The orcs are always fighting and hating each other. Sauron dwells in utter solitude. The company of nine is a company of friends. Friends bound to each other by a deep and abiding trust in each other. They are, so far as Tolkien can be said to be offering historical kind of echoes, they are the church. As I will be trying to say at 430, my evangelical students at Baylor have the hardest time of all getting this straight. 
That is, there is no such thing as a solitary Christian. There is no Christian by herself. We are Christians only in community with other Christians. We are Christians only as we belong to the body of Christ. I have students who say, but I have a personal relation with Jesus. And I say, good, good. Are you in relation to his person, which is called the body of Christ? When Paul signs all of those letters, Ain Christo, Ain Christo, he doesn't mean something in what we in East Texas call his little pee picking heart. <laughs> Ain Christo means in the body of Christ. So they're a community. Tolkien can't be that overt. But Jesus says, I once called you servants. I don't call you that. I call you friends. The whole of the Eastern Church tries to teach us we're meant to be partakers of the divine nature. And what is God himself? The triune company of total, utter self-giving. That's what we're meant to belong to. And the company is a kind of initial version of that. Secondly, what to do about this problem of death. That's surely to come. Let's read. Tolkien is so much better than I am. First quote on the, on the back side. Bilbo used often to say that there was only one road. It was like a great river. It springs at every doorstep and every path was its tributary. It's a dangerous business, Frodo. Going out of your door, he used to say. You step into the road, and if you don't keep your feet, there's no knowing where you might be swept off to. On the morning of September 9, 2001, 3,000 New Yorkers walked out their doors, not knowing the road they were to step into. Listen then to Frodo's, Bilbo's song. The road goes ever on and on, down from the door where it began. Now far ahead the road is gone, and I must follow if I can. Pursuing it with, and he had said the first time, eager feet. He was, as it were, your age. Let me get at it. No, he now says, with weary feet until it joins some larger way where many paths and errands meet. And whither then, I cannot say. The key word there in that passage is the word errand. Errand. It does not mean going to Kmart for dental floss. And Aaron is a word Tolkien takes over from the Middle Ages, especially the Renaissance, where an Aaron is a mission. Knights errant, you know that term? Sure. Knights errant go out on missions in behalf of their ladies. And so Tolkien is trying to say the only way to travel the perilous road of life, where more than likely things are not going to turn out well, I remember giving a lecture in Cornwall, and a lady saying to me, have you ever noticed those who are not Christians come to a sticky end? I said, lady, I thought our Lord came to a rather sticky end. <laughs> yeah. We may die from a terrorist strike. We may die from cancer. Probably cancer is already ramping in someone's gut in this room. Doesn't know it yet. That's not what matters. Not what matters. What matters is whether we have an errand, a mission, an aim, a purpose. And Tolkien's word for that, of course, is the word quest. And he makes a fundamental distinction that you really must get, and I'm sure you have. Can anyone tell me the subtitle of The Hobbit? 
which Peter Jackson is now about to release into two films. Yes, sir. There and Back Again is the subtitle of The Hobbit. Can you see the arc that that image creates? There and Back Again. Bilbo is bored. The elves come along and say, this awful dragon named Smog stole our jewels. Help us go and get them back from him. Bilbo says, sure, I don't have anything better to do. I need a little bit of adventure. And that's the key word. And adventure is there and back again. Entertainment, which drives our whole culture, is there and back again. You don't have to have a calling. All you have to do is desire to have some fun. We call it, in Waco, striking out for the left coast. I don't know what you call it here. Something would be the equivalent, I guess maybe parts of Boston. In any case, he says over against there and back again is a quest. Quest has the very same Latin root as the word question, seeking, striving for, and not knowing how things are going to turn out. You know where you're aiming, but you're not going straight there. Remember, it takes them forever to get to Bree in in the first book. They're lost half the time. They don't know where they are. They go backward. They go forward. They go in reverse. They have no assurance that their mission will succeed. And neither do we. But let's read what I think may be the most important passage in the whole book. It's number eight on your page. This is just at the edge of Mordor. Remember, Mordor is Sauron's own realm. Mordor is the Anglo-Saxon word, you can get it, murder. Orc is the Anglo-Saxon word for demon. Notice in The Hobbit, Tolkien uses the word goblin altogether. But, you know, goblins are the things that, you know, we can laugh and play about. But orc, can you hear it? That's an ugly word. Orc, orc. Tolkien believes in the link between sound and sense. Well, they're in the edge of orc land, so to speak. The edge of Sauron's own lair, Mordor. Near the tower of Kirith Ungol. I don't like here anything here at all, said Frodo. Earth, air, water all seem accursed. But so our path is laid. Now watch it. So our path is laid. Can you hear the passive voice there? You all know the distinction between active and passive? It doesn't say, and so we have laid our path down. If you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. So our path is laid. Yes, that's so, said Sam. We shouldn't be here at all if we'd known more about it before we started. I remember my old Catholic teacher at this little Calpatty College I went to said, if most of us could see what lies ahead of us, we wouldn't go forward. But I suppose it's often that way. The brave things and the old tales and songs, folks seem to have been just landed in them usually. Their paths were laid that way. Can you hear the doctrine of providence echoing in the background without ever the word being used? And if they had, sorry, but I expect they had lots of chances like us of turning back. Only they didn't. And if they had turned back, we shouldn't know because they'd be forgotten. See, they're saints or those whom we remember because they went forward. We hear about, and this is, Sam flunks freshman English in this sentence. Please get it. We hear about those as, he means who, of course, just went on and notice not all to a good end. Mm -mm. At least not to what folk inside a story and not outside it call a good end. And then Sam's question, don't the great tales ever end? And here's Frodo's really 
powerful answer. No, they never end this tale, said Frodo, but the people in them come and go when their parts ended. Our part will end later. Then he corrects himself, or sooner. You see what Tolkien is saying? And can you see how profoundly Christian this is? Tolkien is saying the heart of the gospel is God's grand cosmic narrative of the whole universe. A huge drama in which each of us is playing a minuscule on-stage, off-stage role. And that drama will go forward to its completion according to our faithful performance of that tiny role. If we misperform, the drama is going to be thrown off its course. Someone will have to come and correct our misperformance. If by chance we are true, faithful, obedient to our quest, then we shall have forwarded the drama toward its great cosmic end in Christ. And therefore, whether we would die screaming or not doesn't matter. What matters is that we were faithful, we had hope. What Paul calls hope beyond hope, when human hope runs out, hope that God is accomplishing his purposes even when we ourselves fail. Finally, coercion. How can we overcome coercion? For Tolkien, it's through the highest, of course, of all the virtues, love. Love is not something that you wear as a pendant around your neck. That's why I like the older word charity, because charity is linked up with the Latin word for the heart. And the heart, remember, is not the region of feeling in the ancient world. The heart is the region of the will and of the desires. And so one's truly reformed, rechanged, remade heart is a heart of love. Understood here fundamentally as forgiveness. See, Tolkien knows that in the ancient world, pity is a vice. To have pity on someone who is truly evil is to commit injustice. You haven't given them what they deserve. And notice how that's what Frodo wants. One last passage. Number five. This is when Frodo has said, look, Gollum was trying to kill me. He knew that I had found the ring, and if only he could find me, he would kill me. Therefore, I had the right to kill him, and now that he's trailing us, we have the right. We, in fact, have the duty to kill Gollum. He deserves death. Here's what Gandalf says. Deserve death? I dare say he does. Many that live deserve death. I can't think of a person in this room, especially the speaker, who doesn't deserve death. Can you give it to them? Sorry, sorry. Many that live deserve death, and some that die deserve life. I can think of one who died and didn't deserve it. Only one. Can you? Can you give them life? Rhetorical question to which the answer is no. I have not much hope that Gollum can be cured before he dies, but there is a chance of it. And he's bound up with the fate of the ring. My heart tells me that he has some part to play yet, for good or ill, before the end. And when the end comes, this is the light motif, if you want a good operatic term, of the whole book. It appears in all three volumes. Poor, dumb Peter Jackson can't figure it out. But here it is. The pity of Bilbo may rule the fate of many. And Frodo, yours not the least. In any case, we did not kill him. He's very old, and he's very wretched. So you're with me for Tolkien, then. Faith. Hope. 
love. These three. And the greatest of these is love. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we have some time for questions. We have a portable mic. So if you have questions, please take the mic. You have objections. You